And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is a returning good brother to the temple, the mad genius behind Rookie Jet Studio, coming coming to us straight out of the nasty natty, so I had to get that out of my system, and the madman behind stuff li works like Overarms and Red Giant, now coming back with Gimmick Zero, the one and only Cory, don't call him Monty, Burns. That's me. Hello. <laughs> How you doing today, man? I'm doing fine. How are you? I am doing good. I am lamenting the lack of cold weather, but I will deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm happy it's warm, so I'm sorry you, <laughs> you're dealing with that. So, a couple of years ago I did have you on when you, were, when you just had the quick start out for Gimmick yeah. Zero. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's been a long road, man. Yeah. Um yeah. So in the in the two years since, what are what what can you tell me about what's largely changed or what's bit or what's been filed off regarding yeah. zero? Yeah, I, I think that I just hit like development hell with it kind of. And I mean that in the terms of like a bit off more than I can chew or I could chew at the time in terms of the kind of work that I was doing and the things that I was engaged in. So during, you know, Overarms development, I was really just focused on that, and then I switched to Red Giant, and then in the middle of Red Giant's development, I was also working on Gimmick Zero, and then, you know, things just got really complicated with Red Giant, and it just kind of, it took way longer than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's the biggest book that I've released so far, so it's 144 pages. Um, and that's not normally, you know, any kind of issue or anything like that, as long as it's content and not just a, a ton of rules, at least in my kind of category of rules light. But it it just it took long. I don't know what to say. I mean, it just it's been a slow burn and it's been a long time coming and I'm happy that people are excited to see it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And given given the concept of the whole living weapons to take down machines. I may have asked this two years ago, but did anyone bring up to you the surge? The surge from as as in the as in the um, two video games by Deck Thirteen. What games? Um, the surge and the surge two. Oh, I I've never heard of those, so no, no, nobody's brought that up to me. Huh? That's I'm I'm dis I'm disappointed in my fellow geeks. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, and obviously, we we talked about how how some of the big inspirations were Bubblegum Crisis, Katana Zero, Me uh, Mega Man Zero. I'm guessing because of the whole machine thing, near Automata has been brought has been brought up as well. Yeah, I mean it has, but it's not like I I don't have a lot of experience with that series in general. So like I mean, Gimmick Zero overall ties into a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Um, besides what I've listed is like the quote unquote inspirations for it being like Mega Man Zero, Evangelion, and um, Bubblegum Crisis and things like that. And uh, it's Gimmick Zero is kind of like my first like foray into a original tabletop RPG because it doesn't necessarily fit into like the Evangelion universe. I mean, there's things that you're doing that are similar, but not exactly the same. <coughs> Excuse me. And also with like uh, the Mega Man series and things like that, it's all extrapolated points um, from those series that have been pulled into this game and I've kind of given life. So it's a little more different than stuff like Over Arms, which is clearly inspired by JoJo's Bizarre Adventure or Red Giant, which is clearly inspired by something like Berserk, right? Mm -hmm. So it is it is definitely a, um, a left turn. For Rookie Jet Studio, but it's it's definitely uh, something I'm looking forward to, and something that I think people will enjoy, and that's kind of the direction that we're taking this year. Yeah, 
And when I when I look at the character sheet on the um, on the Kickstarter page compared to the compared to the one um, from the original Quick Start, one of the mm-hmm. big things that I do that I do notice is the is an overheat tracker which was not on the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So overheat is an optional mechanic that lets, um, like, if we look at uh, like overarms, for example, because these that overarms and gimmick zero are very similar. Uh, in their core mechanics and everything. And so when we look at overarms, you have the AP, which is like your anima points, which determines how often you can use your abilities. But Gimmick Zero doesn't really have something like that. It's more uh, freeform, where it's just like, if you want to use your ability, like your ability is that you have jet like jet shoes and you can fly up somewhere, you can use that whenever. Mm-hmm. And Overheat is kind of this give-and-take mechanic that was kind of born out of the exchanges from Red Giant, where in Red Giant you have these these um, exchanges where you get a power in exchange for something critical to your character. Mm-hmm. So you may be able to control a flock of crows that can do whatever you ask them to do or whatever you will them to do, but you your character is blind. You know, so it does something like that in a sense with the overheat system. So with overheat, you're essentially like limited on how often you can do the, uh, you know, how often you can activate your abilities. But it can also help you and it can hinder you in terms of how often you're using those abilities. So I think that people might really enjoy having that mechanic. And it's optional, it's not something you have to include in your game. But it is uh, definitely something that I'm I'm expecting to see some really unique uh, interactions with. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, with that in mi- with that in mind, what I d- one thing that I was curi- was curious about is the is the notion that you're that you're doing where you're not you don't exactly have a set setting more of it more of an more of a setting idea especially especially given the world creation part that's in the, that's in the book yeah um, i'm guessing i'm guessing a lot of that is to is to help to help set it up so that the, so that um you're not li- you're not limited to a specific um setting cuz i think the i think the past two games that you've that you and i have talked about that you've worked on have something of a pseudo setting Overarms obviously being well the modern world and um, Red Giant being a post-apocalyptic Earth. Yeah, so I mean, like the the whole core idea with Gimmick Zero in general is that the way that it's structured is that in every single game that's played at a table, you can think of that as like an alternate universe of the main story. Um, whatever the main story may be, you know, but in every universe there are these, or every timeline, there are these constants of aberrations, gimmicks, and weapons. And so sometimes people fail, you know, like sometimes all your characters at the table die and, you know, the the game ends, the campaign ends, Mm -hmm. or maybe you re-roll with new characters. So I kind of tried to tie that into the tabletop RPG itself and the lore of it, um to allow people a way to you know kind of just incorporate everything around them and all these games into the actual story of the game so if i'm playing a game with you and two other people and you know all of our characters die and then i can you know either take that character or make a new one in another universe all the constants are still the same and you can consider that part of the story um, if that makes sense, based on what you've seen from the game. Mm-hmm. And last time, last time I had, I had mentioned that it's it seemed that there was a leaning towards one shots. Um, what advice would you end up giving if somebody wanted to do a campaign that would go over multiple sessions? Yeah, I mean, like, Gimmick Zero, uh, I haven't highlighted it too much, but Gimmick Zero does have a level-up system. They're called Paragons. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can certainly run a campaign with it. I think that the one thing I'd suggest for it is to just create your own gimmicks ahead of time. Create some stuff ahead of time. 
Um, Gimmick Zero is a game that really hinges on people having creativity and creating their own material for the games. I mean, there's a lot of stuff inside the book. It's 144 pages. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is one of those things where you're going to want to, you know, create your own gimmicks, create your own upgrades, your abilities, things like that. And I'm, I'm hoping it's provocative enough to, you know, kind of give people that, that spark and to help them come up with something that fits their campaign and fits their character and that they can have fun with. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember that before that um, in the previous time I talked, there were three classes that you ha that you had the gunner, the switchblade and the swordsman. Um, Correct. Are those still the main the main three classes or has that has that been expanded? Yeah, those are the main three. I mean, those are kind of just, those are put there just to, you know, set you off and get you started with the game. Mm -hmm. um, but then in the full game, there's one called the custom, which is essentially like the main class where you are, you know, just you're, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm drawing a complete blank. You're basically, um, we want you to create your own kind of character. You know what I mean? Uh, we want you to create your own kind of character at the table. We want you to make up whatever makes the game fun for you, given the framework that you are, uh, or the framework that you have. So, I mean, essentially, like, Gimmick Zero itself is truly a sandbox. It has a lot of toys. It has a lot of tools. It's got a lot of things that you can use to move the environment around you. And it has a lot of stuff that you can pull from that already have function, but it is a it is a type of game that wants you to put your own spin on things and to put your own uh, creative liberties into the game. So it's it's you know the the classes that are there are kind of like yeah they're default, but you don't have to play these by any stretch. Mm -hmm. You can make whatever you want um, as long as your GM approves. Yeah. Now. The core mechanic has players rolling t rolling two die from the from the um, assigned die types, right? And one thing, and that is that is certainly going to be one of those um, things that's not that is going to be counter to people's reflexes. People are get people are going to think of making a check of using just one ability. So using two um, is is going to be one of going to be one of those catching with the other opposite hand kind of things. Um, with that in mind, do you have plans on putting a chart that kind of shows what sort of check would use a, would use given combinations? Like anything yeah, I mean, what might use a strength and intelligence one, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think in every game that I've released so far, at least most, um, there's always some sort of table with check examples, and Gimmick Zero is no stranger to any of that. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a full table that tells you, at, you know, all these different kinds of checks that you can create with these different stats, and there's also, you know, um, many, many, many different combinations that you can come up with aside from the ones listed in the book. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to when it, when it comes to the the ar the nano armor, um, yeah, part of me is curious what so, what sort of um what sort of what sort of arm what sort of armor did you have in mind visually if if someone wanted to if someone was to go on the appearance of how, of how it would look and I, I know bubblegum crisis was mentioned earlier is that kind of the vibe you were going for of that of the night sabers. Yes and no. I mean, it, it, like I said, it's a sandbox. You can you can do whatever you want. If you want to look like a tiny Gundam, go for it. If you want to look like something from Bubblegum Crisis or Mega Man Zero, God bless, go for it. You know, I mean, it doesn't. Whatever fits in your kind of game, for it. That's that's always. I I always flow by the rule of cool, and it's just you know if if there's something that makes sense for you, make it happen. And there's plenty of tools in the book to make it make that happen. And appearance is no different than anything else that I've talked about, you know? So it's just like you you could you could literally do whatever you want. You could look like a person but still technically have your 
quote unquote nano armor. It doesn't matter. It's just whatever your imagination's telling you to do, go with it. Yeah. I w I will fr I will freely admit that because of because of the armor s armor setup, there's plenty of um there's plenty of Toku so Tokusats characters that I've that I've used as reference when I would run the quick start. Um if I had to, if I had to use a few obvious exa obvious examples, um, one of the I'd say one of the big one of the bigger ones <laughs> would be would be um, Netflix Ultraman. Yeah. As a as a visual reference, um, I've used I've used Techman Blade as as visual reference for my players at some point. Um, in some in some cases you in some cases using Karas or some of the Iron Man suits. Um, admittedly, a lot of those are pr are pretty obvious ones, but it's more of helping to helping to bridge the gap for the for the players. But um, right. now, when it, when it comes to Paragon levels on the Pate on the page on the Kickstarter where it shows that it's it says it it's going up to seventh level, um. But is is there is there a reason you stopped off you stopped off at seventh or is is it just that's where the end of the pattern is? You know that's a good question. Um, I think that that's probably just for the quick start. Uh, actually, let me take a look at the book. I have the full thing right here. Mm -hmm. Um, at least a proof of it. So, yeah, actually, yeah, seven. Um, I'm sorry. It's the book's been done for quite a long time. Um, I don't want to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but the book's been done for a long time. It's just a matter of getting like the art, the layout, and the production in place. Um, but yeah, no, I there's no reason why I stopped at seven. Um, it just it just seemed to make sense given the context of the game there. Um. When you look at like all the different upgrades and things that you get, it makes you strong, but it doesn't make you too powerful. And I thought it was kind of unique, I guess, to just end it on an odd number and not at, like something like five or ten, um, and just let it be what it is. You know, if the game works that way and the mechanics work that way, just let it be. Um, you have to kind of figure, I guess, like when you're playing a campaign or like something like that, if you're playing every week, that's seven weeks of, of gameplay. You know, I feel like that's if and that's if you're leveling up like every campaign. So I feel like that the numbers associated with levels don't necessarily matter, but it's more so like, you know, what you're doing with that kind of material. I mean, if we look at something like D&D, &D, they have, you know, 20 levels, right? That can carry you for God knows how long, but then once you get up into the higher numbers, it kind of becomes pointless because you you're basically a god. <laughs> so I think that I think it's it's a little bit um, subjective in terms of you know the mileage that you'd get out of levels, depending on how you're handing those out to your party, how you're managing those. Um, Gimmick Zero itself uses the milestone system, like all of my games do. Mm -hmm. uh, not a huge fan of the experience distribution um, just because it, it excludes people and nobody wants to be three levels higher than somebody else and get into a combat. So I think it, I think it makes sense that way, but you know, I'll leave that up to everybody else to let me know. Mm -hmm. oh. The now when it comes to, when it comes to when it comes to the gameplay flow, um, I may have mentioned this before, but I did come to the come to the realization that the four phases social investigation, combat, and conclusion, you could kind of you could kind of fit that straight into the um Kisho Tenkets st style of um of storytelling that you see all over um all over Asia. There's other translations for it, but I mostly know the Japanese version. And sure, but yeah, but the I'm not sure if you're familiar with Kisho Tenkets. Um, no. It, <laughs> um, There's a lot of things you think that I would know about that I actually don't. Yeah. Um, 
like there, there's other translations of it. Um, again, I just know the Japanese version. Um, it goes introduction, development, twist, conclusion. Okay, so it's phases. Yeah, it's it's akin to the three act structure, just four. Um, okay, it's been used in. Sh I've seen it used in short stories. I've seen it used in, um, in ep in um episode in episode scripts. Um, okay. Miyamoto, Miyamoto has even admitted to using that structure for level design in different Mario games. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Um, it's even been used in, um, in a discussion of photocopying machines. <laughs> like it, it is a very, it's a very versatile concept. Uh, is Miyamoto had specifically set, stated that he used it when it came to uh, Mario Galaxy and 3D World. Hmm. Uh, and, yeah, I, 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 I didn't know anything about that. I, I'm gonna have to look into that. Yeah, um, obvious, obviously, it's not a, it's not a one to one comparison, but it is interesting that they kind of lined up like that, especially given how much of a weeb game this is. Right. <laughs> And when play, when play testing, were there were there any phases that some players had a, had an easier time getting their head around than others? I'm sorry. When play testing, were there were there some phases that um the play, for players that were that were easier to get around? I don't think so. I mean, like. All of my games kind of function around the same same four phases, and a lot of that like language is kind of like reused uh, throughout the games. Uh, not everything has like it, it's usually like social investigation, combat, and conclusion phases. So I don't think that there's anything that you know is is you know wild to anybody. I know that you know one of my upcoming games, Hyper Weapon, is going to have a little bit of dif differentiation with that, or akin to something like Red Giant um in terms of like you know the travel phase or like a journey phase or something like that but in terms of gimmick zero i don't think that there's anything um that you know really confused anybody or changed you know mm -hmm. anything from what people might be used to who have been following and playing these kinds of games from ricky yeah. jet studio now this wasn't in the quick start but i'm guessing that 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 you're gonna have a bigger breadth of well, of well, gimmicks, and do you, and um, in that vein, do you have plans on pu on putting in advice or even a system for creating custom gimmicks? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a little bit of in the book about you know like gimmick development and things of that nature. Um, there is a whole gimmick catalog, and this game actually includes four scenarios versus the usual one. Mm -hmm. that I throw into each game and I they they're pretty long so it has a lot more in terms of like enemy creation things of that nature um I I I kind of hold it true that anytime somebody plays one of you know the rookie jet studio games that it, once you've played it and you understand how the mechanics work and things like that, that creating your own content for it is not difficult. It isn't something like calculating like an armor class for D and D. It isn't something <laughs> where you have to worry about you know breaking the game necessarily. It's just hey, throw these stats in and make a cool ability for the gimmick. It's kind of the same thing as creating a character. It's just backwards, right? So it's it, it, I I don't have any. Uh, Concerns with people being able to create their own content for the game or anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now, you admit you had mentioned that it that um you're shooting for about for about a hundred for about 144 pages, as I recall. Right. Yep. Um. Was was there anything you had to re you had to really change when it came to your writing habits to account for? this being a bit bigger than your previous projects? Yes and no. I mean, there's was, there was more world building in this than there has been in previous projects. I mean, in Red Giant, you have, you know, the, the, the base structure of this, you know, cursed sun has raised these horrors from the planet, and that's kind of your premise. Uh, Gimmick Zero has a little bit more than that strewn throughout the book in terms of the lore and the world building and things of that nature. 
Um, but also, you know, when you have four pretty sizable scenarios in a book and you have an entire catalog of these um, gimmicks, and when I say catalog, I mean, these aren't just like, here's your stats and a quip about it. I mean, here's like their attack patterns. Here's, you know, the, the way that they would operate in the field. Here's the way they're going to operate against you. And so that takes up a lot more page space than anything else. Um, so I think it's just more of getting into the lore, more of getting into the actual um, the meat of the game aside from the rules. And that, that's been a, a total game changer for me, I think, because I, I love writing rules. I love creating uh, rule sets. I like, you know, tying that together with multiple mechanics, but I haven't really dived heavily into just creating that kind of content where it's like, you know, here's a, you know, big bestiary. Here's a, you know, four, five different scenarios or something like that into a book. Here's all these different little pieces that you can use to strengthen your game and things like that. So it's it's been it's been an experience, and also you know the funny thing about Gimmick Zero is that it was supposed to be twenty pages originally, and uh, I was just making it because it was an idea that popped into my head. I wanted to make it into a zine. It was kind of supposed to be something similar to the size of Empty Cycle, which I believe is around forty pages or so, and so um, <laughs> a forty you know, page zine. 40 page zine yep that that's well empty cycle i mean it, it the, the format if you buy it in a soft cover it's it's really like a zine and um when you look at when you look at gimmick zero in its original form which nobody has publicly it it was uh <laughs> it was very small and so now when you get into it it's just like oh it's the biggest project so far because i i constantly do this thing where i start off small and i try to limit myself in terms of what i can add to the game what i can do and then i just i take it far too far and then three years later you finally see the game so, so that's kind of where i'm at yeah i can i can certainly understand that yeah oh now first off congr first off congratulations on getting about twice what you initially planned on get um planned on with yeah, plenty of time, with 23 days to go at the time of this recording. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? Um, so, I mean, the, the game is done. You know, I the, whenever I take a game to Kickstarter, I like to have the, the final copy done. I like to have a proof in my hands. Um, so, I, I'm shooting for, you know, something around July, August to actually deliver the game. Um, Kickstarter is is really a way to market the game and a way to let people know that, hey, this is out here and we want to keep doing cool things. And if you want, you can, you know, back the game, you can get it and, um, you know, help support us. But at the same time, um, there's always little tiny things that we have to iron out that can take a couple months, like limited edition cover uh i've had so many issues with that over the past few months because i kept <laughs> submitting the files and getting the wrong cover on my book and so when i go to release a game like that and i put the time in for you know hey this is going to come out in august you know and people are like well the game's done so can i get the pdf you know can we can we get this kind of material now and then get the book later I hold off because I don't know what might need to be changed. So when I say the game is done, it's like 90% done, but it's it, it's uh, just minor changes and things like that. And I actually just got the limited edition cover in the mail today, and thankfully everything checks out. It looks fantastic. So I think people will probably end up getting it in July, but, you know, also life just gets in the way, you know? I mean, I'd love to do tabletop RPGs full-time, uh, but I do work a day job, and I am one person who basically pulls people in to work on things. And it's a lot of work. It's, you know, I mean, when it comes down to Kickstarter, when it comes down to these books, when it comes to marketing and everything like that, I do I do everything. So, you know, the only thing I don't do is book layout and artwork. So it, it, it is a lot of work on my end, and it takes a lot of time, and I hope people understand that. 
And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing it. Oh. As as I kept, as I mentioned before, when all that we had was just a quick start. Oh. But with all that said, I will. Since I I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple, and enjoy the madness at play here. Absolutely. I mean, thank you for having me on. Mm-hmm. It's always always nice to talk to you. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I love that you've stuck to the same thing for years to come. <laughs> if, it, if it were, yeah, I for plan years on, now. I plan on stick. I've been sticking with it for a, for about eight years now. I don't see any reason to change it. That's fantastic. I love that. Oh. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>